Matthew's record of the genealogy of Jesus isn't a very good record of the genealogy of Jesus. It's inaccurate, incomplete, and inconclusive. It doesn't actually make it to the end. That is a, a bloodline connection to Jesus. One would think that a tax collector whose life depended on keeping accurate records could get the genealogy right. As we've seen the last two weeks, however, maybe Matthew's real purpose wasn't a, a record of the genealogy so much as the beginning of an account of the gospel. The good news of who Jesus is and, and what he came to do. Maybe Matthew is looking back through names to remember some stories and show how God has been writing history for this moment, this advent. And just maybe in the stories these names tell, there are foreshadows of, of who and how and, and what the world will encounter in this one known as Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Savior and King. So. How about one more week in this list of names? I know, who knew there was so much here? You know, there are two names that are distinctly troubling. They don't fit. And, th and there is one name that raises a huge roadblock to Jesus being the Messiah if this is indeed supposed to be a bloodline genealogy of Jesus. The names that don't fit have long caused scholars and translators fits. To some, it appears that Matthew made two glaring errors. Others suggest he made intentional alterations. The earliest manuscripts suggest the latter. A lot of English translations have chosen the former and made corrections. The oldest and most reliable manuscripts of Scripture have the names Asaph and Amos written in place of Asa and Amon. It's quite possible that they are simply variant spellings of the two kings who are appropriately part of this genealogy. Lots of English translations use Asa and Amon to be consistent with how they spell the names of the kings in the Hebrew Scriptures or Old Testament. It is, however, entirely possible Matthew intentionally replaced the names of two kings for a psalmist and a prophet both well known in the earlier scriptures. I lean with the scholars who believe Matthew made the switch. I don't think Matthew is nearly as interested in reporting genealogy as he is in proclaiming gospel. Matthew 1.7 reads, And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Avia, and Avia, the father of Asaph. Asaph or Asa? Asa was the actual son of Avia and the great-great-grandson of David. It is important to realize that it is hardly likely that Matthew would be making mistakes. These generations, especially those leading up to the deport deportation to Babylon, they were known by every Jewish child. Your own genealogy was important, that of the line of David even more so. The life of King Asa was complicated. On one hand, he was known for his reforms. In fact, 1 Kings says Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David his father had done. He, he rid Israel of most of the pagan worship practices, most but not all. He did not remove the high places, the, the pagan worship altars. And in his later years, Asa was known for relying on human strength and wisdom and, and on the king of Syria rather than God. Somewhere along the way, rage consumed Asa when the word of the Lord goes against his own plans and desires. It, it results in oppression, cruelty upon his own people. The most well-known Asaph in Scripture was the psalmist, the songwriter and music director whom David appointed in his court. Twelve psalms are attributed to him. Asaph sings of the faithfulness and the goodness of God through Israel's history. He, he sings of spiritual renewal and of both God's wrath and mercy as well as his righteousness, justice, and steadfast love. God's heart and willingness to save as the true king is a common theme in Asaph's psalms. Using the word Yesha to save, which is the proclamation of Jesus' name in Hebrew, Yeshua, God saves. 
In Psalm 74, Asaph sings, Yet God my King is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. It is also through Asaph we hear of God's desire that people walk faithfully and live out righteousness, mercy, and compassion. As in Psalm 82, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Maybe in replacing Asaph for Asa, Matthew is intentionally foreshadowing how in Jesus God brings rescue and justice and righteousness to the weak and oppressed and and the needy. And maybe it's a, a way of saying humanity has always needed a savior. Well, it also appears that Matthew has replaced the prophet Amos for the king, Amon. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah. Amos or King Amon. King Amon, the actual son of Manasseh, ruled only two years, and his reign is marked with these words in 2 Kings. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh his father had done. He walked in all the way in which his father walked and served the idols that his father served and worshiped them. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his fathers, and did not walk in the way of the Lord. Amos, the shepherd and fig grower prophet, is well known for speaking hard truth to priest and king and people for their meaningless worship practices and injustices. He calls on God's people to lives of justice in keeping with the ways of God's name, God's character, God's honor and will. Words God speaks through Amos are even today raised up against our own injustices and our worship that is only ritual, not servanthood. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Maybe this not-so-subtle alteration of prophet for king is Matthew's way of saying, pay attention. Maybe it's an intentional behold. Behold him who comes as Savior and King, as God with us, the anointed of the Lord, is come to tell us a new reign of God is breaking into the world and will be marked by righteousness, justice, and mercy. Matthew's whole gospel account speaks of Jesus bringing a new reign, announcing a new kingdom that calls for repentance, one that brings healing to those who are sick and, and, and touch to those considered unclean, a, a kingdom which welcomes the forgotten and displaced, raises the dead, feeds the hungry, and forgives real and eternal hope to the oppressed, sovereign, saving reign of God is at hand that is for all the world. A psalmist, a prophet, and finally a problem. See, there is this other little quirk with a rather large implication in, in Matthew's record. The last king listed before the deportation to Babylon is Jeconiah, or Jeconiah also called Coniah. He, he reigns for only three months and incurs the wrath of God for some reason, such that God decrees a curse. No offspring of Jeconiah can ever sit on David's throne. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God declares, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. You see, if, if Matthew is just recording the genealogical record of Jesus, there would be a problem if he actually arrives as Messiah through this line of fathers and sons. But there is a hiccup in the record keeping. It doesn't actually keep going all the way to Jesus. 
the bloodline connection of fathers and mothers, shepherds and kings ends at Joseph. When he finally gets to Jesus, Matthew writes, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. But maybe here we have another point Matthew wants to make. The generations of humanity are indeed broken, cursed, as are the kings extending from David. The only way an offspring of David can establish an eternal throne, the only way the broken generations of humanity can be healed is through the inbreaking of God, a new genesis of humanity for, well, humanity. Matthew writes in verse 18, Now the birth, in Greek, the genesis, of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. It might not be good genealogy, but it is gospel. Shalom, church.